The Neue Marx Lectura, putting the critique of political economy back into the critique of society, by Ricardo Bellofioi and Tommaso Rodolfi Riva. Let's hope I pronounce those names correctly. The project to re-examine Marx's critique of political economy at the end of the 1960s by pupils of Horkheimer and Adorno is nowadays known as the Neue Marx Lectura. This new reading of Marx, initiated principally by Alfred Schmidt, Hans Georg Bachhaus, and Helmut Reichelt, ex attempted to free Marx from the petrified schemas, petrified schemes of Marxist orthodoxy. In this article, we will try to reconstruct the beginnings of this project, tracing its roots to Adorno's critical theory of society. From this perspective, we will proceed to examine Neue Marx Lectura's original approach to Marx's theory of value, its understanding of the, quote, logical character of this theory, and how the contradictions of the commodity form and the double character of labor constitute an autonomization of society. Finally, we will outline some problems with Neue Marx Lectura, where criticism and further dialogue would be fruitful. The birth of the Neue Marx Lectura. According to many interpretations of Marx, he proposed a labor theory of value, which revised that of Ricardo. These interpretations tend to focus on the first two sections of the first chapter of Capital, leaving the sections about the form of value and the fetish character of the commodity to play a supplementary role. According to this approach, Marx first looks at the commodity as both use value and exchange value. Then he argues that behind exchange value there must be something common to commodities that are exchanged, which grounds their commensurability, that is, value. Finally, he connects this value to labor. This may appear complete, however. If we stop here, we miss the whole point of Marx's theory of value. What actually distinguishes Marx's critique of political economy from the economic theories before him, as well as those after him, is the theory of the form of value. Marx's critique of political economy tries to answer the following question. Why value? Why is value nothing but an expression of labor? What are the conditions of possibility of the existence of value? Which is an, a, quote, objective social dimension. A court, end quote. According to which commodities are exchanged. And why does the content of value, i.e. labor, take on the form of a thing, that is, money? These questions, which can be found more or less explicitly in Capital, and in the preparatory works for Capital, at least from the Grundrisse, were, with few exceptions, not seriously addressed by Marx's followers and interpreters. This changed in the 1960s with the contributions of Bachhaus, Reichheld, and Schmidt. Emerging from the Frankfurt School at the height of its post-war influence on the New Left, they contributed decisively to the revitalization of the West German study of Marx. The general issues raised were Marx's relationship with Hegel, the continuity or not of his value theory with political economy, the nature of his materialism, and so on. But at the heart of these issues was the radicalization of Marx's break with classical political economy, especially that of Ricardo and the resulting break that this induced with classical Marxism. A new heterodox reading of Marx emerged. Bachhaus can be considered as the initiator of Neue Marx Lectura. In 1965, he held a seminar as part of Adorno's course at the University of Frankfurt. Under Adorno's influence, he elaborated the essential elements of a new interpretation of Marx. Four years later, he published the best-known and most widely translated of his essays, On the Dialectics of the Value Form, 
This is the blueprint of the research program that became Neue Marx Lectura. Backhouse saw in the established reception of Marx's critique of political economy a collapse of Marx's theory of value into that of Ricardo and a consequent misunderstanding of the specifically Marxian approach to political economy. The Neue Marx Lectura putting the critique of political economy back into the critique of society. Ricardo Bellafiore, what the hell? I think I'm just reading, this is just a misprint, sorry. Fucking god damn it. I'm going to reread the last sentence and then pretend that this weird interruption thing didn't exist. Bachhaus saw in the established reception of Marx's critique of political economy a collapse of Marx's theory of value into that of Ricardo and a consequent misunderstanding of the specifically Marxian approach to political economy. These misunderstandings included treating Marx's dialectical method of presentation as mere wordplay or the logical mirroring of a historical process and treating his argument about the form of value as a historical, logical overview of the emergence of money, or simply ignoring it altogether. As Bachhaus put it, the, econo quote, the economistic interpretation is bound to miss the critical intention of Marx's value theory. The critique of political economy is made into one economic theory besides many others, end quote. But Bachhaus also made clear that this misunderstanding of Marx's conception of form is not a simple failure to understand what Marx wrote, since Marx himself was not able to develop a definitive exposition of the form of value. Hence, the only way to understand the critical intention of the dialectic of the form of value requires reconstructing it from its partial expression in a range of Marx's texts following the different versions of the argument from 1859, contribution to the critique of political economy, to the second edition of Capital. Both Bachhaus and Reichelt date the birth of the Neue Marx Lectura to Bachhaus stumbling upon a copy of the first edition of Capital, the book, in the library of the Frankfurter Walter Kolb Studentenheim in 1963. Quote, after a first look, it was possible to notice a categorical difference in the construction of the concepts and in the positing of the problems of the theory of value, which in the second edition were only sketched, end quote, Bachhaus. Bachhaus began to examine the text in a private working group with Reichelt, Walter Oichner, G. Dill, Gisela, Gisela Kress, Gert Schaefer, and Dieter Senghaas. What they found most interesting was the presence of a dialectical contradiction in the analysis of the, quote, equivalent form of value, something that was more difficult to detect in the second edition of Capital. The Hegelian concept of, quote, doubling, in those years analyzed by Karl Heinz Haag, an assistant of Horkheimer, and used by Marx in the first edition's presentation of the form of value, assumed a new logical sense. From this perspective, Marx's dialectics in Capital had to be treated as a logical issue, and none of some vague philosophical wording empty of theoretical consequences. In fact, Neue Marx Lectura's point of departure lies in a critical rediscovery of Marx's method of presentation. The dialectical concepts of contradiction, doubling, semblance, phenomenal manifestation, substance, and so on, were expunged by orthodox and or, quote, economistic readings. For Neue Marx Lectura, by contrast, they became the key to understanding Marx's critique of political economy. Adorno's Legacy Reichhaus claimed 
that the discovery of the first edition of Capital would have had no consequences if it happened to someone who had not attended Adorno's lectures on the dialectical theory of society. The reason is that the uniqueness of Marx's critique of political economy lies in what Adorno termed, quote, the anamnesis of the genesis, end quote. Marx's critique of political economy represents, in fact, a theory of the constitution of society as a subjective, objective reality. As Bachhaus explains, society is objective since it is, quote, abstract universality, which subsumes and dominates particulars, end quote. At the same time, society is subjective, quote, because it only exists and reproduces itself by virtue of human beings, end quote. The concept of society as subjective objective reality was essential for Adorno. A society where exchange is systematically dominant, quote, extends nature in a heteronymous manner, end quote. In an exchange society, reproduction in the social realm is akin to a natural necessity. Capitalist society is a specific structure in which individual actions erect an objective realm that dominates social agents themselves. The capitalist mode of production destroys the antithesis between nature and history. The legality to which social agents are submitted is a social construction. But this social construction acts on social agents as a law of nature. Quote, the objectivity of historic life is that of natural history, end quote. Dialectical social theory must show that, quote, society, what has been made independent, is in turn no longer intelligible. Only the law of becoming independent is intelligible, end quote. Capitalist society as a whole, oh, capitalist society is a whole, a totality, a universal, according to Adorno, quote, there is nothing socially factual which would not have its place in that totality. It is pre-established for all individual subjects since they obey its constraint even in themselves. Sorry, I'll, I shouldn't I said that wrong. Constrainte even in themselves. I have no fucking clue what that means. And exchange is the synthetic principle that imminently determines the connection of every social fact. Exchange realizes the objective social connections. It is the principle of mediation that guarantees the reproduction of society through a process of abstraction that, quote, implies the reduction of the products to be exchanged to their equivalents, to something abstract but by no means as traditional discussion will maintain to something material, end quote, Adorno. Adorno maintains that it is possible, starting from the analysis of the exchange, to understand the autonomization of society that characterizes capitalist society. The abstraction present in every exchange is not subjective because it is, quote, independent, both of the consciousness of the human being subjected to it and of the consciousness of the scientist, end quote. In the capitalist mode of production, there exists a principle of, quote, reductions to unity that allow the exchange between commodities. Quote, what makes commodities exchangeable is the unity of socially necessary abstract labor time, end quote. But such a unity is not determined through a subjective process of abstraction executed by exchangers. Rather, quote, abstract labor time abstracts from living opponents, end quote, who are embedded in a social relationship that has become autonomous. Money is, quote, accepted by naive consciousness as the self-evident form of equivalence and thus as the self-evident medium of exchange that relieves people of the need of such a reflection, end quote. Therefore, Marx's insight into value, money, and capitalist fetish characters is the key to understanding the autonomization of society, according to Adorno. Quote, 
The concept of commodity fetishism is nothing but this necessary process of abstraction, which presents itself to economics as a natural process, a being in itself of things, end quote. The dialectical nature of exchange lies in the fact that, quote, on the one hand, commodity fetishism is a semblance. On the other hand, commodity fetishism is ultimate reality, end quote. It is an illusion since what is perceived as natural springs from social relationships in which social agents are integrated. It is reality since the reduction to unity transcends the consciousness of the agents imposing a, quote, objective legality on them. A dialectical theory of society has to be able to understand the process of autonomization of society and, by the same token, explain, quote, the forgetting of its social genesis, end quote. This is incisively formulated by Adorno in a conversation with Alfred Zohn Ratel. Quote, Historical materialism is the anamnesis of the genesis, end quote. Historical materialism exposes the law of societies becoming independent, uh, of societies becoming independent, and the theoretical oblivion of this process. Here lies the foundation of Adorno's critical theory of society and the point of departure for Neue Marx Lectura. The connection of the autonomization of society with the analysis of exchange is all the more significant to recall, since it remains an embryo in Adorno's writings. In 1965, Adorno still expressed the necessity of, quote, a systematic encyclopedic analysis of the abstraction of the exchange, end quote. But Adorno never accomplished this. Reichelt convincingly observed, that in Adorno's reflections on exchange and real abstraction are some... Or, 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 excuse me. But he never accomplished this. Reichelt convincingly, Reichelt convincingly observed that in Adorno's reflections on exchange and real abstraction, quote, are summarized all the topics of dialectical theory, but all the claims remain on the terrain of asser asservation. End quote. And that, quote, the whole of critical theory depends on a clarification of this objective abstraction. If it is impossible to concretize this objective concept, all other concepts of the critical theory are exposed to the accusation of social theoretical speculation. End quote. Neue Marx Lectura can therefore be understood as a project of, to deepen and even to ground Adorno's critical theory of society. Hermeneutical Perspectives While, Mr. While Western Marxism privileged the early works of Marx as a key to understanding his later works, Neue Marx Lectura reads Marx's critique of political economy as the key to understanding his work as a whole. The critique of political economy is seen as an unfinished project, of which capital and the preparatory manuscripts are only the exposition of, quote, the universal concept of capital, end quote. Furthermore, Neue Marx Lectura claims that this universal concept of capital is not completely developed by Marx in the form of its presentation and needs to be reconstructed by recourse to Marx's other works. To understand the critique of political economy, it is necessary to understand the implication of Marx's method. It is not possible to separate the form of the presentation from the economic contents. We have to follow the dialectical form of presentation of the theory, and often it is even necessary to go beyond Marx's formulations. This is a perspective that Neue Marx Lectura shares with the reading initiated by Althusser. As Schmidt states, quote, Important as Marx's understanding of his own work may be, it often lags far behind what Marx offers in the way of theories of in his material analyses. End quote. Bachhaus's early interpretive standpoint considers 
the misinterpretations of Marx's theory to be his interpreter's misunderstandings. However, in the third part of his Materialen zur Reconstruction der Marxian Wert theory, <laughs> Bachhaus changed his view and subsequently saw these misunderstandings as originating in Marx himself. A thorough analysis of Marx's different presentations of the form of value allows the reader to understand his approach as both historical and logical. Following Marx's exposition in the first edition of Capital and some passages in the Grundrisse, the development from the elementary form of value to money can be understood as a logical, synchronic development. But it can also be understood as a historical process if the reader follows Marx's exposition in the appendix of the first edition or the second edition of Capital. According to Bachhaus, to reconstruct Marx's theory, we have to take a different hermeneutical perspective. We cannot just follow Marx's own text. Rather, we have to understand the questions Marx tried to answer and then choose which explanations can best answer those questions. Sharing Bachhaus's approach, Reichelt states that, quote, in capital, only the bare bones remain, end quote, of the dialectical presentation of, quote, the increasing autonomization of exchange value, end quote. The analysis of the different expositions of the theory, as well as of the development of the grounding concepts in Marx's Grundrisse, take on for Reichelt, too, an essential role in the reconstruction of a strictly Marxian theory of value. Another original interpretive approach taken by Neue Marx Lektura regards the relation between Marx's early and later writings. The Neue Marx Lektura authors oppose Althusser's diagnosis of an epistemological break and propose a unitary reading of Marx's works, employing the same methodology used by Marx himself of studying earlier social formation, formations from the perspectives revealed by later social formations, a method illustrated by his infamous claim that the human anatomy contained the key to the anatomy of the ape. In just this way, Neue Marx Lectura read Marx's early texts through the later texts, thereby recovering their significance rather than abandoning them to pre-Marxist positions, as Althusser proposed. As Schmidt put it, quote, The early writings of Marx and Engels, which for a long time were considered to contain the Marxist philosophico-humanist content proper, can only be fully understood by a historical economic analysis of Das Kapital, end quote. Thus, for example, Reichelt, insists that the process of inversion between civil society and state, bourgeois and citoyen, earth and heaven, developed by Marx in earlier works, has to be understood under the light of the critique of the categories of political economy. That is to say, the critique of the forms of capitalist society require understanding the reasons why human relationships present themselves in the form of coercive economic laws. Similarly, Bachhaus shows that what in Marx's early works is very often jettisoned as a philosophical residual is instead to be seen as the first attempt to develop a critical method that recognizes, quote, the isomorphic structures of the ontotheological, social metaphysical objects, or the isomorphic structures of the political and economic objects, end quote. Just as the theological debates presuppose the duplication of the earth in the opposition of heaven and earth, every debate in the discipline of political economy presupposes the economic forms of exchange, value, money, price, and so on. Quote, Marx's central demand is that the economists should not presuppose categories or forms, but they should instead develop those categories and forms genetically. End quote. The inauguration of this genetical method is found by Bachhaus in the economic Bachhaus in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, where Marx touches on the quote unreflected presuppositions end quote of political economy. Quote, Marx is speaking here about money that in its function operates as an inhuman subject. Namely, it makes unequal things equal, stores, value, transfers, etc. 
the independent laws of things of things quote outside man present the quote objective moment of the economy end quote Bachhaus drink time Hegel and Marx The philosophy of Hegel, and especially his logic, is seen by the Neue Marx Lectura as a fundamental source for understanding Marx's exposition of the critique of political economy. Schmidt starts from the meaning of the term critique in Marx's Critique of Political Economy. Schmidt remarks that for Marx, there are no social facts in themselves which can be apprehended through traditional disciplinary boundaries. The real, quote, object of knowledge is the social phenomenon as a whole, hence capitalist totality, but this latter must be understood not as if the empirically given conditions of production are immediate, the immediate object of knowledge. Rather, Marx proceeds through a criticism of bourgeois categories and theories. Theory and its, quote, objective content are related, but they are not one and the same. That's why the method of inquiry is formally different from the method of presentation. The method of inquiry, Schmidt explains, deals with material from history, economics, sociology, statistics, and so on, and through the, quote, isolating and analyzing of understanding. The method of presentation, in contrast, has to bring concrete unity to these isolated data. Quote, exhibition, following Hegel, proceeds from immediate being to mediating essence, which is the ground of being. A central reality must manifest itself phenomenally, but this concrete instantiation of essence is distinguished from its manifestation. Although even the most abstract categories have a historical determinant dimension, the logical curse the logical course is different from, and even opposite to, the historical course. These issues are further developed by Schmidt in his History and Structure. For Hegel as well as Marx, reality is process, negative totality, is a process, negative totality. In Hegelianism, this process appears as a system of reason, that is, as closed that is as a closed ontology from which human history sinks to the level of being its derivative, a mere instance of its application. By contrast, Marx emphasizes the independence and openness of historical development, which cannot be reduced to a speculative logic that all beings must forever obey. Hence, negativity comes to refer to something which is limited in time, while totality implies the whole of the modern relations of production. Jesus Christ. There is a nociological primacy of the logical moment over the historical. Without a prior theoretical understanding of capital, one would not know where to look for the historical presupposition of its birth. But this does not make categories the existential ground of reality, as for Hegel. Rather, categories mediate reality and knowledge. However, this critique of Hegel does not cancel Marx's debt to the Hegelian notion of system. The concrete is not what stands in front of human intellect, but a, quote, unity of the manifold. Knowledge which even though it has as its necessary basis in an analytic method, dialectically evades the dichotomy of the factual and the mental. Thus Marx proceeds logically and not historically because the form of capital that he developed posits its own conditions of existence. If Schmidt emphasizes the role of Hegel's method in Marx's critique of political economy, Reichelt expands the argument in the direction of an ontological relationship. 
He claims that Marx was obliged to employ a dialectically structured argument for an objective constraint. Since there is a structural identity between the Marxian notion of capital and the Hegelian notion of spirit. In Marx's thought, the expansion of the concept into the absolute is the adequate expression of a reality where this event is happening in an analogous manner. Hegelian idealism, for which human beings obey a despotic notion, is indeed more adequate to this inverted world than any nominalistic theory wishing to accept the universal is something subjectively conceptual. It is bourgeois society as ontology. Presentation as, quote, exhibition, or, quote, exposition, or, quote, exhibition, takes on a new ontological meaning. This dialectical method is as good or bad as the society to which it corresponds. It is valid only where, quote, universality asserts itself at the expense of the individual, end quote. And it is, in fact, the philosophical doubling of the real inversion. The characteristic feature of materialistic dialectics is then the metoda auf Widerruf, the, quote, method of withdrawal according to which the method has to dissolve itself as soon as its conditions of existence disappear. Reichelt also stresses Marx's employment of the concept of Uber Greif and des Zuject in the exposition of the transformation of money into capital. Quote, as the overgrasping and dominant subject of this process, in which it alternately assumes and loses the form of money in the form of commodities, but preserves and expands itself through all these changes, value requires above all an independent form by means of which its identity with itself may be asserted. Only in the shape of money does it possess this form. Money therefore forms the starting point and the conclusion of every valorization process. End quote. Reichelt. Reichelt understands the overgrasping and dominant power of capital in the light of the absoluteness of Hegel's concept, which, quote, discloses on the ground of philosophy the secret of bourgeois society, the inversion of a derived reality into a first. Hence, in Marx's thought, the expansion of the concept to the absolute is the adequate expression of a reality in which this event happens in an analogous manner, end quote, Reichelt. A similar argument is found in Bachhaus. Hegel is at the beginning of Marx's, quote, revolutionizing of the theory of commodity, of money, and of capital. Precisely because of this his way of exposing the theory in a dialectical structure. Hegel, however, was just a first step, since he was unable to develop the dual character of the commodity. However, Bachhaus also points out that Hegel did see this duplicity very well in some unpublished writings unknown to Marx. For Bachhaus, Hegel repeats a shortcoming of Ricardo and political economy in general, the forgetting of the genesis, even though this categorical apparatus potentially gave him all the theoretical means to accomplish this task. On Marx's method and the critique of pre-monetary theories of value. The starting point of the Neue Marx Lectura reconstruction of Marx's critique of political economy lies in questioning the interpretation of Marx's method as logical historical, which is initiated by Engels' discussion of, quote, simple commodity production and spread by Marxism. According to Bachhaus, 
Engels' 1859 review of Marx's A Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy and his 1895 supplement to Capital Volume 3 led to a historicization of the Marxian method of exposition. In the review, Engels refers to Marx's logical method of presentation as, quote, nothing but the historical method, only stripped of the historical form and of interfering contingencies, end quote, Engels. In the supplement, Engels applied this same historical method to solve the alleged contradiction between values and prices of production, making values the ruling system of exchange ratios in a historical stage of simple commodity production. For Bachhaus, the notion of simple commodity production is the basis for two different interpretations of Marx's logic, the logical historical interpretation and the hypothetical interpretation. According to the historical interpretation, value theory is the logical understanding of the laws of simple commodity production. The form of value is the logical mirror of the historical emergence of money in society. According to the latter, the hypothetical interpretation, value theory is a first, not only, not really, according to the hypothetical interpretation, value theory is a first, not really historical, but rather hypothetical approximation to prices in capitalism. Values are the law of exchange ratios in a generalized exchange society. This step has to be supplemented by a second step, the second approximation, namely prices of production as the law of exchange ratios in a fully capitalist society. This paragraph on the form of value is once again read as a historical excursus from bargain to monetary exchange. These interpretations, though different, share the idea of an initial stage of generalized exchange without money and have in common a historical reading of the form of value. Bachhaus puts together the two views under the label pre-monetary theories of value and insists that Marx's value theory has to be understood as a criticism of these pre-prior non-monetary... Bacchus puts together the two views under the label pre-monetary theories of value, and insists that Marx's value theory has to be understood as a criticism of these prior non-monetary approaches. Quote, Marx wanted to show that it was not possible to construct a non-contradictory concept of pre-monetary market economy organized on the basis of the division of labor. The concept of a pre-monetary commodity cannot be thought. End quote. Bachhaus. The passage from the total or expanded form of value to the universal form of value shows the logical impossibility of a universal exchange without money. In the dialectical exposition leading to the form of value, Marx's exchange process has to be understood as circulation, a form determination of exchange where, not products, but commodities assume the money form. That is, the price form. Circulation here must be distinguished from exchange, as such, which is a sort of transhistorical concept, an abstraction devoid of any effectual existence, like, quote, labor or products. We may then have Waren Ausstausch. Waren Ausstausch, which is essentially money, monetary, and production Ausstausch, which is not. From this point of view, the critical content of Marxist theory can be contrasted with both objective, classical or Marxist, and subjective theories of value. Both kinds of approach share the idea that it is necessary to abstract from money. Sorry, I'm spacing out. From this point of view, the critical content of Marxist theory can be contrasted with both objective, classical, or Marxist, and subjective theories of value. Both kinds of approach share the idea that it is necessary to abstract from money, which is reduced to a veil, 
in order to understand exchange and construct a theory of value. The result is a double failure, a naturalization of capitalism, and a confusion about the role of money in society, in a society where private, autonomous, and independent firms have to finally validate the value produced in a universal circulation, through exchanging commodities with money as the universal equivalent. Pre-monetary theories of value create a double system of measurement of value, the first according to the dimension by means of which commodities are commensurable, labor or utility, the second through money. These measurement dimensions are not mediated. The external, quote, objective phenomenon of monetary exchange are disconnected from the dimension of value, which is theoretically presupposed as independent from money. As Bachhaus puts it, there is, quote, a split between subjective value and objective exchange value, between the substance subjectively interpreted and the form objectively anticipated of value, end quote, Bachhaus. Moreover, for Bachhaus, Marx's criticism can be directed at most theories of price, as well as to those authors who remove the dimension of value, as do many followers of Srafa. They find nothing sensible in the question presented for the first time by Aristotle of why heterogeneous objects become commensurable. The problem is not satisfactorily resolved, satisfactorily resolved by the nominalistic theories of money. According to Bachhaus, according to Bachhaus, Jesus Christ, Money can be considered as an abstract unity of account only after having determined the dimension that it measures. Following Bachhaus, we have to say that the value dimension in Marx is a metaphysical dimension where things take on, quote, socio-natural properties, end quote. The Marx presented by Bachhaus develops a powerful criticism against all value theories bringing back the circulation of capital to an abstract pre and trans historical I feel like Ron Burgundy, right? Just like keep reading things off the teleprompter that uh whether or not they make any goddamn sense. I don't know what the word is that is pre and a word? I think it might just be a space, but there's no space. The march presented by Bachhaus develops a powerful criticism against all value theories, bringing back the circulation of capital to an abstract pre- and trans-historical exchange, and by the same token suggests a theory of money that goes beyond every form of nominalism. Money is seen by Bachhaus as integral to the com to commodity circulation, as what autonomously, out of the consciousness of agents, meaning not in the consciousness of agents. Out of, not of, me meaning not from, but um, beyond. Uh, constructs the social coordination of private labors. The concept of money understood as a conventional means created in order to simplify the exchange is for him untenable. The doubling of the commodity. I'm going to blow my nose. You can all fucking listen to it. <sighs> oh, that's fucking disgusting. I'll get another one. Ah, <sighs> oh, that's better. Got a bit of a cold, you know? Fucking people don't know how to keep their goddamn germs in themselves. And who has to suffer? Me. And that's the only suffering in this world that matters. Any hooser. The doubling of the commodity. The interconnection between value and money as, quote, the ideal and real doubling of the commodity is one of the main themes developed by Reichelt. Building on Bachhaus's first essay, 
Reichelt argues that the novelty of Marx's presentation lies in the exposition of the commodity as the immediate unity of use value and value. This imminent contradiction can be outwardly expressed only when the two sides of the commodity are considered in their actual relation to the process of exchange. Political economy examines the commodities either in their concreteness as use values or by means of an act of subjective and purely mental abstraction as values. Marx's investigation of the form of value shows that the subjective reduction is actually, quote, an abstraction which is made every day in the social process of production, end quote. Something that can be understood only through a deep examination of how value manifests itself phenomenally in exchange value. Reichelt begins his argument by emphasizing that exchange value always occurs between two different concrete things, two different use values. Commodities never directly exhibit themselves as expressions of human labor, though every commodity has a price, and, as prices, commodities can be compared. Quote, Marx criticizes bourgeois economy since it does not deduce the form of money from the structure of private labor. What Marx wants to say is that political economy is incapable in front of the price form, that is obliged to understand extern that political economy is obliged to understand externally. End quote. In every equalization within commodity exchange, the commodity on the left side of the equation exhibits its own congealed value in the concreteness of the body of the commodity on the right side. The two dimensions are taken into account simultaneously. Quote, the commodity obtains a form of value different from the commodity's natural shape, and a different commodity accounts as the first commodity's values immediate natural shape as a phenomenal form of, quote, congealed homogeneous human labor, end quote. Bachhaus. The imminent opposition, excuse me, Reichelt, not Bachhaus, Reichelt, the imminent opposition within the commodity finds its form of phenomenal manifestation through the doubling of the commodity in the exchange value. One side of the equation becomes the use value in the relative form that exhibits its own value in the body of the other commodity in the equivalent form that counts only as objectifications of value. Human abstract labor as a visible incarnation in a body in which it can express itself. Its value is not anymore just, quote, a thing of thought, but acquires also a thing like existence. The abstraction of value is made concrete in an autonomous object confronting all other use values as commodities. As Marx states, quote, commodities are things, they have to be what they are in a thingly way, or else reveal it in their own thing-like relationships. End quote. The exposition of value as money and price, with abstract labor obtaining a thing-like form in the universal equivalent, is the theoretical result of Marx's articulation of the form of value. Reichelt follows closely Marx's dialectical deduction from the simple form of value to the universal equivalent form, and then to the money form, showing how, in the process of exchange, the contradiction between concrete and abstract labor, as well as between private and social labor, is sublated. On the one hand, private labor spent in commodity production must be exhibited as social labor. On the other hand, in non-capitalist societies, concrete labors are different forms of activities of the same subject. In universal capitalist commodity exchange, a similar result must be accomplished through the bizarre circumstance that labor acquires the supersensible property of being human abstract labor, which is the substance of value. Abstract labor that is, private labor in the process of becoming social labor. Ooh. Ooh, that's good. That's a very good... Sorry, I'm going to 
Hold on, I feel like that's a very good description of abstract labor. Private labor in the process of becoming social labor. Perfect. Very succinct. Requires that commodity becomes abstract labor, that is, private labor in the process of becoming social labor. Requires that the commodity becomes effective as use value. That is, that concrete labor is confirmed as part of the, a social division of labor. That is, the contradiction, which is the differentia specifica, of a society where labor is not immediately social in production as such. In a system of private exchanges between independent producers, social labor comes about only thanks to the final monetary validation on the commodity market. Quote, the existence of the universal form of equivalent is the form in which the contradiction this contradiction is analyzed and hence sublated. Social validation of private production can happen only by the metamorphosis with a commodity in which the labor expended in production counts as immediately social. This commodity is the universal equivalent, money. Only the exchange between money and commodity establishes the social necessity of the labor expended for the production of a particular commodity. The reason why labor expended in the production of commodities has to express itself in the form of money lies in the contradiction between the two characters of labor producing commodity. commodities. As Reichelt stresses, Marx's theory of money is based on the deduction of money from the structure of the process of exchange, but also in the deduction of the universal form of equivalence, understood as the necessary interconnection between value as form, value as substance, and value as magnitude. After the presentation of the doubling of the commodity in simple circulation, Reichelt develops the positive side of Bachhaus's critique of the notion of simple commodity production. Reichelt presupposed an understanding of Marx's theory of money as, quote, a further concentration of the deduction of money realized in the most abstract form, end quote. Examining the logical relationship between the spheres of circulation and production. In simple circulation, the members of society present themselves only as exchangers. Nonetheless, circulation cannot be considered an autonomous process. Commodities are exchanged in circulation, but commodities production is presupposed. Once commodities are sold, commodities leave the sphere of circulation and enter the sphere of consumption. The presentation of the different functions of money developed by Marx in the third section of Capital is understood by Reichelt as a process of progressive independence of money as the thing like being of abstract wealth. Marx's analysis of hoarding in the Grundrisse becomes pivotal. In order to gain independence as value, money needs to ex exit from circulation. But out of circulation, money is only potential abstract wealth. Quote, the reality of universal wealth that exists as a thing, i.e. money, lies outside itself. In the totality of the particulars that constitute universal wealth that exists as a thing, i.e. money's substance. The, contradic end quote. the contradiction is sublated as soon as money takes on the form of capital. Self-valorizing value that acquires the form of money commodity, money prime. Quote, In each of these forms, it, i.e. money as capital, remains exchange value in itself. Hence, it is money not only if it gains the form of money, but also if it has the form of commodity. In each of these forms, it is by itself. End quote. Reichelt follows Marx's argument, showing that simple circulation is the manifestation of a process that resides outside of simple circulation, that is, capitalist production, and the Eden of the innate rights of man is the semblance disguising the appropriation of unpaid labor expended in the production of commodities. Circulation has no autonomous existence. 
Marx's theory of value presented in the first three sections of Capital is not the sketch of a system of commodity production in which the subjective and objective conditions of production are still not separated. It is only the surface of the capitalist production process. The commodity with which Marx starts the presentation as a presupposition is then posited as a capitalistically produced commodity. This, of course, is exactly the opening of Marx's results of the immediate process of production, which is one of the clearest examples of Marx's method of, quote, positing the presupposition. Moreover, the labor going on in the capitalist production of commodities is a living labor of wage workers. In a famous passage of the Grundrisse, Marx refers to this as abstract labor in motion. The objective constitution of society. What emerges from a close reading of Reichhout and Bockhaus is that according to the form of determination of the expenditure of labor, it is not possible to determine prior to actual exchange the amount of immediately private labor expended in production that will obtain the form of money. That is, that will be validated as immediately social through the metamorphosis with the commodity produced by a labor which counts as immediately social. Marx's critique of Proudhon in the chapter on money in the Grundrisse, is seen as fundamental to, the under, to understanding the double character of labor, as Bachhaus shows. Quote, Marx deduces the concept of social labor and discovers a contradiction between this form of labor and the actual one that has a private character. This contradiction is considered by Marx to be the reason why labor exhibits itself in value, or in other words, the reason for the existence of money." End quote. The critique of Proudhonian socialism is at once, and by the same token, the exposition of the theory of the form of value, and the conceptual deduction of the money form from the social constitution of a society of private and autonomous producers. Sorry. The critique of Proudhonian socialism is at once and by the same token the exposition of the theory of the form of value and the conceptual deduction of the money form from the social constitution of a society of private and autonomous producers. Without understanding the connection between money and the form of the expenditure of labor, Marx's theory of value misses its own specificity and is brought back to Ricardo's theory of value in which the quantity of value produced can be determined through a subjective act of measurement in production. A certain kind of labor theory of value completely misses the contradictory nature of the capitalistic production in which Marx states, quote, A priori, no conscious social regulation of production takes place, end quote. And the social character of labor, quote, asserts itself, only as a blindly operating average. End quote. Blindly operating average. Value theory is for Marx a super individual dimension that takes place independently from the consciousness of the agents of production. The abstraction of labor is a process and cannot be reduced to a mental generalization. Abstract labor cannot be confused with labor as a meta-historical, goal-oriented activity. Labor as such is a mental abstraction that never exists without acquiring a determinate social form, whereas abstract labor is the specific form that labor acquires in a society in which the social metabolism with nature takes place through a system of monetary exchanges among private producers. As is often repeated by Bachhaus and Reichhaupt, Marx's theory of value consists in the understanding of how the law of value asserts itself. Therefore, in the knowledge of that, quote, objective 
process that happens behind the backs of economic agents. The fissure between the individual dimension of production and the supra-individual dimension of social validation and exchange is essential to understanding the meaning of the fetish character of the commodity, which Marxism had reduced to a banal reference to historicity of value and of the capitalist mode of production. We can speak of a fetish character because private production processes have no previous coordination besides the one that happens by means of the exchange between commodities and money. Money is the medium that establishes the social connection of private productive processes. And hence what creates society, quote, behind the back, end quote, end quote, out of the consciousness, end quote, of the individual agents. The social connection is determined by a system of exchanges between commodities and money that is between things. The standpoint of political economy assumes an, as unproblematic the universal exchange of commodities in the form of value. The same is true about capitalist organization of labor. That is why political economy is unable to comprehend the, quote, perversion and, quote, displacement of a social relation established by means of things. Bachhaus says that, quote, academic economics is obliged to handle value or a form of value as a thing outside human beings. Money is compared with those mathematical forms like line or number, which only doubtfully can be deduced by the human being. End quote. Bachhaus. Following Marx, Bachhaus describes the categories of political economy as deranged forms. Economic categories are crazy, deranged, displaced forms. Economic categories are transposition, a transposition and projection of the sensible over the suprasensible. Super sensible. Economic theory knows only the results of this craziness and displacement. The critique of economic theory has the task of exhibiting the genesis of these verrückte Formen, their human origin. Reconstructing Marx's theory of the value form, of value. Bachhaus and Reichel grasp the meaning of the process of autonomization of the social relationships described by Adorno. It is the outer manifestation of the fundamental contradiction of the capitalist mode of production, the double character of labor and that produces commodities. Because of this contradiction, the socialization of labor occurs independently from the expenditure of labor, through a system of monetary exchanges among private producers which generates an autonomous form of motion of society, the fetish character. Thanks to this understanding of the fetish character of the commodity, Bachhaus and Reichel are able to fulfill what Adorno considered essential for a critical theory of society, not only deciphering the, quote, social genesis of the autonomization of society, but also understanding the forgetting of the genesis which leads to fetishism. Universal monetary commodity exchange of things on the market makes the historically specific social character of capitalist production seem as if they were natural attributes of those things. Forgetting of the genesis of the autonomization of society originates from this shine this, quote, false appearance, a semblance. This externalization of the capitalist mode of production springs from this objective reality itself, from its fetish character. The forgetting of the genesis is accomplished. Critique and Dialogue We 
think that the problematization of Marx's value theory, the stress on the form of value, and more generally, the conceptual horizon proposed by the Neue Marx Lectura, are crucial for a correct understanding of Marx's capital. At the same time, we think that there is room for a dialogue with and perhaps a critique of Neue Marx Lectura. This article has been mostly expository so far, but we think it is important to consider some problems. Some of these have to do with difficulties in Marx's own deduction. Others concern Neue Marx Lectura's insistence on the critique of political economy, as if Marx's critique was not also, as surely he intended to be, a critical of political economy. The risk is to reclaim Marx as a philosopher against Marx as an economist and academic compartmentalization that is foreign to Marx himself. We think that the Neue Marx Lectura pays insufficient attention to the complexities of Marx's notion of abstract labor, value, and money, especially in chapters 1 to 3 of Capital Volume 1, as well as to how Marx grounds capital as a social relation in chapters 4 to 7. If we reconstruct Marx's dialectics of value, money, and capital, we see that the duality within the commodity, as use value and value, corresponds to the dual nature of the labor producing it. Labor, as activity, is concrete inasmuch as it produces the commodity as use value, and abstract inasmuch as it produces value. The difficulty is that use values and concrete labors are not homogeneous, thus are incommensurable. Value, on the contrary, is for Marx congealed labor pure and simple. A homogeneous amount which is commensurable as such, at least when we look not at the single commodity, but at the entire world of commodities. Neue Marx Lectura departs from Marx when it insists that commensurability comes from exchange alone. Let us look at this more closely. In paragraphs 1 and 2 of chapter 1, value is hidden in the commodity and is nothing but a ghost. It is yet to be shown how this purely social entity can gain a material existence. Before exchange, what we seem to have in front of us are just concrete labors that are embodied in different use values that are incommensurable. In paragraph 3, Marx goes on to demonstrate that there is a doubling of commodity money slash money that corresponds to the duality within the commodity as use value value. Once a definite commodity, say gold, plays the role of the universal equivalent, the ghost that is value has been able to take possession of a body. Money is now value, which is embodied in the use value of gold. The abstract labor contained in commodities is exhibited in the concrete labor embodied in gold as money, and private labor becomes social. Money is the universal equivalent, ex post, validating the quote, immediately private and only immediately social abstract labor. But it is also the individual incarnation of value the result of the only labor which counts as immediately social, namely the labor of producing gold as money. In this respect, money as a commodity is the essential link connecting value back to labor. This key point has escaped the attention of Neue Marx Lectura. Thanks to this link or equivalence between the abstract labor tentatively producing commodities and the concrete labor producing money as a commodity, Marx grounds the possibility of translating monetary magnitudes into labor magnitudes, giving way to the notion of a monetary expression of socially necessary labor time. The Neue Marx Lectura is right in insisting that this equivalence is established through exchange on the commodity market, rather than purely in production. However, Marx always insists that the commensurability does not go from money to the commodities, but in, the exactly, in exactly the opposite direction. The exhibition of the value of commodities in the use value of the money commodity is a movement from the inner to the outer. It is an expression of the content into the form. The unity between production and circulation 
is established on the market, but that unity actualizes a movement from the inner production to the outer exchange. How can this tension be resolved? In our view, Marx's argument is that values, as congealed human living labor in the abstract, after production, and before actual exchange, count as ideal money magnitudes anticipated by agents. It is a forced along. Commodities go to the market with a price tag. On the other hand, the equivalence between commodities and money amounts to an equalization in substance. On the other hand, the amount of ideal money is a, quote, mental representation, end quote, of gold as real money. Money acts as the external measuring rod of the magnitude of value. The imminent measure is the labor time spent in production in the socially necessary amount. However, this latter dimension has to be validated in monetary form in circulation. Commodity exchanges where the act of measurement is actually going on. Bachhaus is right in arguing that universal circulation of commodities must be thought of always as intrinsically monetary. Verin Austausch and circulation are essentially monetary. Exchange cannot be conceived as a barter-like exchange of products. That is, unmittelbare production, production Austausch. With the problems inherent in barter generating money as their solution. But at this point, Marx's quantitative determination of the value of money turns out to be decisive. The value of money is the inverse of the, quote, monetary expression of socially necessary labor time, end quote. How much labor time is exhibited in one unit of money? In the first section of Capital Volume 1, the value of money is fixed at the point of production of gold, that is, at the entry point of gold as money into the circuit. Gold is exchanged at first just as mere commodity against all other commodities. This exchange is non-monetary. It is immediate barter. The German here is unequivocal. Unmittel bottom Tauschhandel. Once it has entered the market in this way, as an immediate product of labor, at its source of production, to be exchanged with other products of labor of equal value, gold functions as money. From now on, the value of money can be taken as given before final exchange. The finalization of exchange imposes the discipline of value on producers already during the production process before exchange, so that living labor must already be accounted as abstract. The fact that money is a commodity in the deduction of the first three chapters is not particularly problematic. Here we are at a level where the explicit objects of knowledge are produced as commodities, and money as the universal equivalent. In other words, production is presupposed. The argument becomes shaky when we move to the level where the object of knowledge is capitalist production of commodities as a temporal process, beginning with the buying and selling of labor power and proceeding to the hidden abode of production. It is our opinion that at this point, we are in a world where money cannot be assumed anymore to be a commodity. The theoretical challenge is to prolong the monetary labor theory of value into a monetary theory of capitalist production. Following these lines, it is possible to argue that production needs to be anti-validated, pre-validated, by a non-commodity banking finance of the buying and selling of labor power. In this case, living labor as abstract 
would be made homogeneous by a monetary process before a final exchange. Marx's argument about the movement from production to exchange would be fully rescued. The early Neue Marx Lectura does not delve into this terrain, leaving Marx's theory of commodity and money interrupted. Another point where Neue Marx Lectura stops too early, in the stages of Marx's argumentation, concerns the constitution of capitalist totality. Under capitalist social relations, the inversions characterizing the world of commodity and money are confirmed and deepened. On the labor market, human beings become the, quote, personifications of the commodity they sell, labor power or potential labor, which is the commodity of which the workers are a mere appendage. Within production, living labor itself is organized and shaped by capitalist value and process. So once again, living labor, as the abstractivity of wage, abstract activity of wage workers generating abstract capitalist wealth, is the true subject of which the concrete human beings performing it are just predicates. To be actually self-grounded, value must be produced by value, earning a surplus value. But dead labor cannot produce more dead labor. What is needed for capital, what is needed is for capital to, quote, internalize in production, the activity which may turn less dead labor into more dead labor. That is, turn the only otherness into dead labor which is the living labor of human beings. Value as a ghost must turn into capital as a vampire. Workers are included in capital, dead labor, as an internal other, living labor, to borrow Chris Arthur's enlightening expression. Marx's notion of capital as self-valorizing value looks increasingly homologous to Hegel's absolute idea seeking to actualize itself while reproducing its own entire conditions of existence. As Adorno would have said, das ganze ist das anvara. In a sense, I have no idea what that means and there's no translation. In a sense, Neue Marx Lectura is a long footnote to this phrase, and the attempt to establish its ultimate foundation in the critique of political economy. Can I just be a pet peeve, pet peeve for a second? I really fucking hate when I'm reading something and it has, maybe I've even said this before, but I hate when it has like Latin, and just assume that you're such a genius and so well read and sophisticated that you know what the hell they're talking about. It's not Latin here, but it's German. I have no idea what das Geinze ist das Unvara means. Sorry. Where am I? In a sense, Neue Marx Lectura is a long footnote to this phrase, that we don't know what it means, and the attempt to establish its ultimate foundation in the critique of political economy. However, capital's zombie life is dependent on a social condition. Capital must win the class struggle in production. Capital has to suck away from workers their life so that it may come back to life as undead. Workers may resist their incorporation as an internal moment of capital. This surmountable barrier or obstacle may become an insurmountable limit if conflict turns into antagonism. The key point is that it is not possible to have labor without pumping it out of labor power. It is not possible to use labor power without consuming the bodies of the workers themselves. As the living bearers of labor power, capital produces only thanks to this very specific consumption, which creates a very specific contradiction. And this is indeed the true pillar of the labor theory of value as the unique Marxian theory tracing the new value added in production back to, to the living labor expended by workers. The anamnesis of the genesis 
Adorno's legacy to Neue Marx Lectura develops here into a way of looking at capital's paradoxical reality from the view of its living source, the point of view of its living source, the point of view of its source. <laughs> well, that's the last paragraph. So I'm cracking up, you know, it's like the last day of school. The anamnesis of the Genesis, Adorno's legacy, Tanoia Marx Lectura, develops here into a way of looking at capital's paradoxical reality from the point of view of its source. Living labor resulting from the exploitation of wage workers as living bearers of labor power. This is the critical and revolutionary discourse on the constitution of capital. And there's a bunch of footnotes here, which I'm going to read privately and not read aloud, because that's tedious. Thanks for listening. Like and subscribe, nation. <laughs> Free Association Nation.